Part of the original fascination behind the Daleks was that Terry Nation conceived of them not as maniacal invading monsters, although that certainly came later, but scientists and inventors living in a city which was decorated with sculptures and contained normal shops selling foodstuffs. The retail of the Daleks didn't make it to screen, but in the final script they remained curious and resourceful beings. With many alien races, which are usually humanoid, we see little of their culture except their preoccupation with conquest, which makes it all the more fascinating to discover that the Daleks enjoy art and partake of gardening. Unlimited quantities of fresh vegetables. In some ways, the Dalek people are more human than most aliens which came later, and yet it's all juxtaposed with this remarkable appearance. One example of the cultural texture seen in the first television serial was the use of a particular tool. This Dalek has a cutting torch fitted to the end of its telescopic arm. When the movie adaptation of this story was made, the production team made decisions which not only added another layer of complexity to Terry Nation's Dalek society, but produced a unique prop which somehow managed to be both indispensable and undesirable to the director. This is the sizzling and somewhat surprising story of the bizarre blowtorch Dalek. If you'd like to support our research, contribute ideas, and see clips and early videos, then check out the link in the description on how to join our Patreon. When the TARDIS crew are making good their escape in episode 4 of the Daleks, entitled The Ambush, the quick-thinking Doctor jams the door to block their pursuers. But the Daleks are not easily stopped, and cutting equipment is applied to break in. Terry Nation's original outline, titled The Survivors, often differs wildly from the final script, but the scene with the cutting equipment was present right from the very beginning. There are small interesting differences in the development of the storyline, however, because in the original outline, the Dalek casing in which Ian is trapped, and is referred to as a suit, is too bulky to allow all of them to enter the lift together. Ian therefore pushes the others into the lift and presses the control. In the rehearsal script, no reason is given at all for why they don't try to get Ian's Dalek inside the lift, they just abandon him. But it was felt that some kind of explanation was needed for this drastic pragmatism, so in the final version, dialogue is added which establishes that Ian's Dalek casing can't be moved because the floor has been magnetised. The scene was edited together from two sessions. The human characters were captured on the 9th of December at Lime Grove Studios with the feed from the video cameras transferred directly to film stock. However, all the blowtorch material and the Dalek movements had been pre-filmed weeks earlier at Ealing Film Studios, as tended to be the case with any complex effects work. To figure out the logistics of pre-filming in this new TV series, the producer Verity Lambert had met with director Christopher Barry, designer Barry Newbury and others on the 30th of September, and the outcome of the discussion was that the blowtorch scene would be amongst five days of filming at the end of October. But unfortunately, this didn't factor in when Shawcraft would be able to deliver the finished Dalek casings. As it turned out, these didn't come available until the middle of November, and as a result, the door cutting scene wasn't filmed until the 26th of November. The editing of this scene is very disjointed. Viewed from the direction of the SKPs, the Dalek makes its incision in the top left and moves its blowtorch down. But in the next shot, it's at the top of the doorway, travelling right. The third shot seems to be the bottom right corner of the door, but when we finally switch to see the other side, the cutting is back at the start position. This shot was done after the real blowtorch cutting had been finished. It's possible to see that the incision below is already completed ahead of where the tool is making its way down. For this effect, a specially constructed attachment was created to replace the Dalek's sucker, and a pyrotechnic was fitted to produce sparks that emulated burning through metal. 
Further inconsistency comes in the next shot, when we see cutting is taking place at both edges of the door simultaneously, with the work about three quarters done on each side. The next shot sets progress back again to about halfway, before it jumps ahead again to being finished on the right and almost completed on the left. The final shot gives a good view of the fake cutting attachment with its sparkler, but this shows that it's not actually in contact with the surface of the door and the cut already exists beneath it. Once the Daleks enter the lift room, we get another good look at the cutting device, and this is the last glimpse we get of the special attachment in this serial. However, its reinterpretation for the big screen is where the story really gets interesting. The movie adaptation of this scene chooses yet another option to explain why Ian can't go in the lift. It stops just short of the floor. But the rest of the events play out in a very similar way, with one significant difference. The cutting tool is not simply a swapped out alternative to the regular sucker, it was a completely bespoke new arm. In the movie, the blowtorch Dalek comes into view with flame already lit and, without a word being spoken, gets to work cutting into the door. Aside from the obvious, which we'll come to shortly, there are two main differences between this Dalek and its fellows. The collars on the shoulders are more of a bronze colour compared to the yellowy gold of the usual drones, and the neck section is painted a dark metallic blue instead of the extremely pale metallic blue of the others. The whole body of the prop has been weathered to evoke the idea that this is a factory worker Dalek. Its oily surface creates the wonderful notion that it's been drafted over from a dirty industrial area of the Dalek city. And its custom paint job could be seen as a little joke that this individual is a blue collar worker. This Dalek's arm is of course the notable feature. It has a more organic and flexible protuberance than any other member of its race with the section extending from the body being made from a leather or waxed canvas material riveted into the sides of the gun box. An open hole reveals a previous attempt at developing this arrangement. So that the operator inside could reach his arm out as far as possible, it's reasonable to assume that underneath this fabric the whole front of the box has been cut away. The middle section of the arm is a multi-part rigid metal tube with a rounded end, and extending out of its opening is the business end of a gas-powered cutting torch. It is specifically a cutting torch and not a similar looking welding torch, because it has three gas pipes rather than one or two. That additional third pipe is for the oxygen jet, which helps to burn and blast the melted metal out of the cut. In the rest of the set of the Dalek City, the doors would have been made from hardboard, but to perform this close-up effects shot, a real metal panel is used. Once the torch has heated the surface until it's red hot, you can see the moment where the operator activates the oxygen blast, which breaks through the malleable surface. Although the initial point of attack is around waist height, the next shot disappointingly cuts back to show the torch pointing at the top of the doorway, clearly too far away to be effective at that distance and is merely scorching the surface. This is unfortunately at odds with the next shot, which is a reverse angle, again showing a level cut rather than one angled upwards. At least two different full cuts were performed on metal doorways, since these two shots don't match, and on one of them the metal panel seems to be mounted in some kind of frame. In the final practical effect shot, the blowtorch apparatus has been removed from the Dalek casing so that it can be manually held at head height to film the slice being completed. And in this position, the majority of the torch's gas pipes have been retracted inside the cylindrical metal arm. With the effects work on the real metal door now complete, there was a break in filming and this whole corridor was rejigged slightly with the control desk moved a couple of feet to the left. The cut door from the second take was then mounted behind the corridor doorway, in such a way that the Dalek guard could then push it open. Which is a little odd, as it leaves you feeling that the whole door might normally hinge upwards like a giant cat flap. With its job done, the blowtorch Dalek withdraws, and you'd be forgiven for thinking it's never seen again. But you'd be wrong. Despite this scene not occurring until beyond the midpoint of the film, 
you've actually already seen this Dalek twice, and you would see it several more times before the film was over. The fabulous CGI visuals in our episode have been created by the supremely talented Anthony Lamb, whose amazing work has graced Big Finish covers, SFX and Doctor Who magazine. He currently has a set of limited edition prints available from the worlds of the Daleks. Place an order while stocks last. There's a link in the description to take you straight to him. Although the film made great use of 10 dummy props for filling up the background, these were too roughly made to be used prominently in any scenes. With two of the eight hero props being red and black, the director Gordon Fleming was determined to make the best possible use of the six remaining blue Daleks, despite the fact that one of them had an unusual appendage and a different colour scheme. Fortunately, the colour differences were subtle enough that the blowtorch Dalek did not stand out too obviously amongst the five other standard drones. It was therefore decided that this unusual worker Dalek could be used throughout the rest of the film, from the very first to the very last scene set in the Dalek control room. So despite seeming to only debut midway through the film, it's actually amongst the first seven Daleks we see on screen. It makes its first appearance on the far left of the semicircle of Daleks which initially capture the time travellers. Its blue neck is not obvious in the low light at the edge of shot. It next makes a lengthy appearance just after Ian sabotages the CCTV. In this beautifully choreographed long tracking shot, the blowtorch Dalek is on the right of picture attending the controls and we are able to see its unusual appendage but the torch nozzle and gas pipes have been de-installed. It can just be glimpsed between two other props as it turns downstage. After its big moment cutting through the door, its next brief use is very well disguised behind the semi-opaque screen as the Daleks all hide ready for their ambush. Another gorgeous shot revealing the back projected main control screen briefly shows the blowtorch Dalek attending the right hand panel of the control unit. Publicity photos taken from the lighting gallery afford a great view of its stubby little arm. It's perhaps a little surprising that it wasn't given a telescopic arm with a sucker or pincer attachment to replace the torch fitting, but perhaps with no internal socket mounting to hold it in place it might have been too much of a hindrance for the operator inside to keep hold of. The unique Dalek next appears in the chanting scene in which a very cunning bit of lighting puts the props slightly in shadow to help disguise the fact its neck section is a different colour. It's also positioned to hide its atypical arm situation. The scene in which Ian, Barbara and the Thals just manage to escape a normal Dalek drone in the lift reveals that all the Daleks have the means to instantly blast through solid metal, in which case the laborious cutting scene of the door earlier becomes rather pointless and so too does the entire existence of the blowtorch prop. The climax of the movie brings some final shots of this special Dalek, beginning with this nice side view. A publicity photo shows the prop at the opposite end of the set in a shot not represented in the final cut of the film. It then gets manhandled off to the left ahead of this effects shot. This overhead view reveals that one of the hemispheres on the back panel has caved in a problem which would seem to plague this prop more than the others in the weeks that followed. We just catch another glimpse of the blowtorch Dalek on the left here in the moments before the explosive conclusion, and then the blowtorch prop is seen for one final time playing a key role in the destruction of its own civilization. It is the prop closest to the camera on the extreme right of picture, and one of the five which discharges its fire extinguisher weapon towards Ian accidentally destroying the entire Dalek race, for the time being anyway. Once filming wrapped, the props went into storage before the next phase began, the publicity drive. These photos were taken on the 17th of May in the Shepperton Studios backlot, outside the studio garages. The distinctive buildings with their curved roofs can be seen in the background, and this site would later be redressed for part of the location shoot on the second movie Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD when Susan, Wyler and Dortmund find the van. 
In these pictures, the Daleks were being loaded for a trip to the south of France, where they would make a promotional appearance at the Cannes Film Festival. At the time this was planned, three hero props were also being borrowed by the BBC for recording of the chase, as documented in our previous video, so it was decided that all remaining hero props would be used at Cannes, and this included the blowtorch Dalek. Even before it left London, there were problems with its condition, as two hemispheres had caved in. Technicians were performing a little remedial work even as the Daleks were being loaded, but fixing the hemispheres was too difficult a breakage to mend without more time. The road journey was nearly a thousand miles, and the props arrived four days later, and they garnered a lot of attention. The blowtorch Dalek was photographed around the 26th of May 1965, with the image revealing its condition was deteriorating. It had lost its tumbler lights and the skirt hemispheres were in an even worse state. But some aspects of the shabby appearance weren't new. The patchy effect on the hemispheres is actually present in the movie, but it's much harder to see on screen than in the bright sun of the French Riviera. The blowtorch Dalek returned to England around the end of May, and the three movie Daleks that had been used by the BBC for recording of the chase were also returned shortly after the 8th of June. Then their next mission could begin. To generate interest in their big screen adventure, a nationwide publicity campaign was organised, which utilised every available prop, and this included the blowtorch Dalek. The tour began with props being dispatched up north on the 12th of June, to give more children the thrill of meeting the heads of the Dalek hierarchy, extra pairs of normal casings were repainted black and red. Around the 7th of August, the blowtorch Dalek was part of a squad of five props deployed down Oxford Street, where they menaced members of the public. The group included two dummies, one of which was painted black, plus a hero prop we number RU3, which was now painted red. Four props were installed in a suite on the third floor of Selfridges, which was kitted out to look like the control room from the movie, whilst one Dalek remained on guard on the ground floor. Visitors' recollections from the time suggest that the number of Daleks present may have dwindled after the big opening. This photo of the blowtorch Dalek trundling down Oxford Street appeared in the Evening News and Star on Monday the 9th of August. It is the last confirmed sighting of this prop, and as ever, we are always on the lookout for contemporary photos from family albums that may help our research. This unique Dalek was the first casing ever to be modified to reflect the different roles in Dalek society, and similar of its kind would be seen again on television in later years. Planet of the Daleks in 1972 retrod a lot of the original TV serial, including featuring a Dalek which cut through a door to pursue the Doctor and his friends. When the Daleks returned to Doctor Who in 2005, writer and executive producer Russell T Davis wanted to honour the resourceful characterisation of the Daleks from the 1960s, and he wrote in a scene in The Parting of the Ways in which a specialist Dalek revealed a cutting torch inside a claw attachment. Despite its brief moment in the limelight, this peculiar prop lived long in the memory, perfectly symbolising the technical yet quirky cultural origins of the very first generation of Daleks.